Luke chapter 2, and the kids are staying with us today, so they're not leaving. And uh, one of the concerns a lot of pastors have at Christmas time is going over Luke chapter 2 when people say, oh, I've heard it and I know the story and I've heard it a bunch. Well, I will ask you, if you would please, to uh, today pay, pay attention and focus. And I'm going to put this down because it always ends up falling off somewhere. Uh, and that uh, hopefully the Lord is going to speak to us today. I've mentioned that last week if you were here. If you weren't, I'll remind uh, those that were here and inform those that weren't. Is, uh, does anyone need a Bible? If you do need a Bible, if you slip your hand up. I see Samuel there and Chris. And they'll be happy to get a Bible to you if you'd like to read along. We are going to probably turn to one or two passages. I'll keep them close so it'll be easy to find for many of you. Uh, also, if you're here today visiting with us, we are so honored that you would choose uh, Autumn Creek to be with us and worship the risen Savior on this uh, time we celebrate his birth. There should be a little card right around you in front of you somewhere, a yellow card or a white card. We use those for prayer requests or to, make a, uh, to have a, a mem memorialize that you were visiting with us today. If you'd fill that card out, we sure would appreciate that. And then there's some uh, black boxes back there, the ben uh, benevolence boxes. You can just slip those in there or give them to one of our deacons uh, or just pass that along to me if you'd like. I'd, I'd love to have that information, uh, know that you were here visiting with us today. So if you're in Luke chapter 2, we're going to look at these first 20 verses. I'd invite you also, if I may please, to ask you to stand as we read. If uh, you've got bad knees or backs, feel welcome to stay down. But if you'd like to stand for the reading of the word, I would invite you to stand uh, and for the reading of the word. And Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20 says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He was to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in that same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came up upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold... I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away, from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God, for all the things that they had heard and seen, and it was told unto them. You may be seated, and I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to open our hearts and minds to the word that he's provided for us today. If you'd pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word and the reading of your word. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ that we, should, we celebrate every day, but especially this time of the Christmas season. We slow down from our busy lives, and we come and we worship the risen Savior, and we remember that one time that risen Savior that was exalted so highly came in humiliation to the earth as a human baby lie and laid in a manger. Father, we ask that our hearts would be open to receive your word, and it would not just inform us today, but would transform us as we leave and we go back out into the world this, uh, shortly. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, in this opening passage, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 1, in the next couple of verses, I like that it says that it came to pass. It didn't say a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. We hear that and we chuckle. 
or uh, once upon a time. But when it says it came to pass, this was a real time in history. There were real people involved. There were actual other historical documents that said this is exactly what happened. I know they say uh, the Bible tells us the end days that people would think the Bible is a fairy tale and fables and stories. Folks, this is a life today. It was the day God sent, spoke it into existence. And so it starts out with, and it came to pass. This did happen. And you might say, well, why did it happen 2,000 years ago? And the only thing I can tell you on that is Galatians tells us that uh, at the perfect fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born as a man under the law to fulfill the law so that we might become the children of God. I don't know why God picked 2,000 years ago. Most people would, and I kind of support the idea of about 6 to 4 B.C. is when Christ was born. It might not have been at zero, but folks, don't get caught up. I've been watching a lot of uh, History Channel and those ancient aliens and those other silly shows. Everything with them is about extraterrestrials and I will say there are supernatural things going on in our world and man's kind grasp of trying to figure out whether well, there can't be God there's got to be some answer they grasp for all this stuff well this last week or so as I've been watching some of that I, I, I found so many of these expedition shows and adventure shows and history channel and archaeology trying to disprove the gospel story or the, or the birth of Christ even saying what well, wasn't at Bethlehem and he was called Jesus of Galilee or Jesus the Nazarene and that's not Bethlehem and, and they throw all these smoke screens. Folks, when you hear that and when I hear that, whether it be on TV or from a person, here's what I hear. Did God really say? I go back right back to the serpent in the Garden of Eden telling Eve, did God really say? Yes, God really said. This is, the, this is where I, I get my compass from. This is where I live my life and have staked my life and my family's life on these words found in Scripture. So when you see these things or hear these things, don't get caught up with human wisdom of, oh, well, all these people and these scientists have said and, and, and the Bible's not quite accurate. The Bible's either 100% accurate or it's not accurate at all. And I've chosen years ago to decide, this is the book I will read and base my life on, and I believe it 100%. And you can call, be called a fundamentalist or a... Christian crazy person or whatever, that's fine. That's what I choose to believe. And, and it, by the grace of the Holy Spirit has opened my eyes to that. And I hope he, he's opened your eyes to that truth as well. So it starts out, and it came to pass, real time, real, real dates, real people, that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Folks, I'm going to jump ahead because I get so excited as I saw this and was studying this week, and we're not there, we'll mention it in a few more verses. The ruler of this world, ultimately we know, is a supreme God in heaven named Jehovah. He, he is the supreme leader. So when it says here that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus over the whole world, the angel, here, do you like that? You, come get taxed, the whole world's going to be taxed. Or do you like peace on earth, goodwill toward men? The real ruler of the world sent out a decree also. And the real decree is peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's a much better decree than come get taxed. I don't even like that first one <laughs> at all. I love the second one. And you just see the difference between the world system and God's system. The world system, we will take from you. God's system, I will give you. What a radical difference. And just in these opening verses I read that, a decree went from Caesar Augustus. Augustus meant revered one or one to be worshipped. And of course the early Christians had a serious problem with that. And, and basically we can't say that. There's things we can't, they wouldn't say Caesar Augustus. Many of you know that's Octavian who was uh, Julius Caesar's grandnephew and Julius Caesar adopted him and gave him this name Caesar on his deathbed because he had no male sons. Julius Caesar said on the Ides of March, March 15th, when he died on his deathbed, he said that my su uh, successor will be Octavian, my grandnephew, and his name will be Caesar. And the people gave him the name Augustus, meaning the, the royal, the, the worshipped one, the, the, the savior, all those names that we hear that we say, those names don't apply to a human being. Those names apply to Jesus Christ. That's what those names apply to. And so I, I, here in the notes there was a... a, a Papyri found it, it said back 2,000 years ago, where is the providence which has guided our whole existence and which has shown us such care and liberality has brought our life to the peak of perfection and giving to us Caesar Augustus? 
whom it filled with virtue for the welfare of mankind, and who being sent to us and our descendants as a Savior, has put an end to war and has set all things in order, and he was repeatedly called the Savior of the world. Do you see the devil having a very different plan than the plan that God has at the exact same time? Caesar Augustus was brought on the world stage and given these titles, Augustus one or worshiped one or savior. And they said, you know, mankind has reached the pinnacle. I can't help but think of the Tower of Babel. We will reach God by our efforts. Folks, that's spirits in the world today. How do you get to heaven? If I do the right things, if I say the right things, if I do enough good to outweigh my evil, I will earn heaven. Absolutely, that's a lie from hell. The devil is a liar. I like to say that every Sunday. And I like to say it several times. I'll say it again. The devil is a liar. But it's, so in this time that Jesus, the story of Jesus be about to mention, it does bring in this story of time. And I thought about that, and I thought about the evilness of the world system and Caesar Augustus, and then I kind of got happy, and I hope you do too. They thought Caesar was supreme. He wasn't. God has a chessboard. He said, Caesar, here's what I'm going to tell you to do, and Caesar did it. This decree wasn't from Caesar. This decree was from God. And we know the Old Testament. We know back in Genesis 39, Rachel was in Bethlehem, then uh, called Ephrathoth at the time. And we know that from Micah. But if you look at uh, Genesis 39, I think uh, 19, it says, And Rachel cried out for a son, and she was at Ephrathoth, which is also called Bethlehem. And she got Benjamin, well, Beno- Benoni, and then uh, Jacob changed his name to Benjamin, son of my joy. And she had the baby, and she died there. And it said there was a pillar built there at that time, even up until the time Moses wrote the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And then in, uh, so we see that God had ordained that a ruler would come from Bethlehem, and as Caesar thought that he made this ruling for his purposes, there's a supreme, or, a supreme being over even Caesar. And folks, there was a supreme being over Caesar 2,000 years ago. There's a supreme being over our government today. C- Caesar or government or Austin or Washington is not supreme. We don't live according to the world's standards. We live according to biblical standards. We're in the world, but not of the world. And then it says, uh, this taxing was first made when, uh, I'm reading out of King James, it says, Cyrenius, yours might say, uh, uh, Corinius was governor of Syria. It's interesting, for many years they said, well, Corinius was governor uh, in about 6 or 7 AD. And so the Bible's obviously false. What we found out was Quirinius, upon more archaeological evidence, he was governor twice. And they would do these censuses every 14 years. And so if he was governor in 6 AD, they said he was governor in 8 BC, by, by our reckoning of the, of the uh, calendar. So again, we find that when the world tries to disprove it, we find out in the 1700s, the Bible is spot on accurate. What Science just hasn't caught up with the truths in the Bible yet. And it says in uh, verse 2, And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius or Quirinius, depending on your translation, was governor of Syria. This was the first census when he was governor. And that's why I said we also kind of support that 6 to 4 B.C. date for Christ. And I'll say this also, a lot of people get caught up in when was Jesus born and was uh, was it in March or was it in December? Folks, don't worry about that. What we need to focus on, a Savior was born. It's not the when, it's the who that's the important part. So all that other stuff, when you watch your TVs and you're listening stuff and you're wondering, it's fine to speculate and wonder and work through and think on things. But I do notice down in verse 19, it says, Mary pondered or meditated on these things in her heart. That's what we really need to spend our time and our focus on, is that who mankind is, our sinful nature that made enemy or war with God, and God in His divine mercy and grace said, I'm going to make a plan to restore you and to redeem you unto myself. And that plan is called Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so while we celebrate this time, and again, I just, these last week or two, as I said, I watched, well, couldn't it be in December, and that's fake, and this is fake, and that's fake? Folks, just don't even listen to that nonsense. That's not even the issue. Here's the issue. God sent his son into the world to pay atonement for our sinful nature because it was a debt we couldn't pay. And I find it amazing of all the people that were born in the world from the time of Adam and Eve and their kids till today, the one man that could pay your sins is the one man that did pay your sins. No other name can do that but Jesus Christ. You can clap for the Lord. 
for the Lord. And so we celebrate this time and, and we go through these stories and I hope that at this Christmas time you say, "Why well, Luke 2, we've read it, I know it, I can, I've almost memorized it. Folks, there is deep theological truths found in these scriptures. And so we move on, it says, And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David. That's probably between an 85 and 95 mile trip, somewhere 90 miles-ish, somewhere in that range that he walked with his nine-month pregnant wife, Mary. I, I suspect that would be difficult. I wouldn't know personally, but some, I, see some, I see about 50% of the people out there doing this. You can guess which 50%. <laughs> yeah, the ones that have been there. And so uh, it says he went, he, they went down together. And, and I suspect, you know, Joseph was told by Gabriel that Mary, his betrothed wife, would carry his child. I've heard people, well, why did he make Mary go that far? If you're betrothed wife is about to have the savior of the world I don't think you'd say well I'm going to go off on a business trip I'll be back in a couple months or a couple weeks I think you'd say when that baby is born I want to be here when the savior of the world is born I want to be present and see this myself he knew the story from the angels from the angel Gabriel and so they go together they make this uh, pass they, they travel past Shiloh and again I mentioned that a moment ago Shiloh you might remember is where Hannah where Samuel the prophet Samuel 1st 2nd Samuel where Samuel uh, served as a priest. And Shiloh, there's a lot of different speculation, but basically Shiloh is translated, um, uh, it's the Lord has redeemed, or the Lord's presence. That's why I said there's a couple different, but all of it has to do with the Lord doing something. The Ark of the Covenant was at Shiloh for 369 years. In a moment we may get up to Micah, in Micah where it says, all this will happen until Shiloh comes. Well, if you translate it the one way, the Lord's presence, when Jesus showed up as a baby, guess what happened? The, the Lord showed up. The Lord's presence showed up in the physical realm. God is always there in the spiritual realm. You know, people say, well, when you're alone, just act like though Jesus is there with you watching. You don't have to act. He is there watching. You know where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is also? There's, I, I, I usually on Sunday mornings, I, the, the last song or two, I'll be over here just praying. I'm like, Lord, please use a sinful man's mind to focus on your words and not mine. Use the mouth of a sinful man to speak your words and not mine. Because when I stand in this pulpit, I, I, not physically, but I sense Jesus is right here with us, watching what I'm saying, listening to what I'm doing, and is glorifying to him. And I say, Lord, let this mouth, let this brain, let these hands be glorifying in your sight and give your message to your people. And I take that, that seriously, and I hope as you're walking in your lives and you're out in the world that you also say, hey, do you know what? Jesus is right here with me. Is my words, my actions, my attitude, my heart, my mercy, my, is all this stuff pleasing in his sight? And, and challenge yourself this year in 2024 I'm not a big New Year's resolution guy, but if, if you are, Lord, help me in 2024 to grow and mature and become more and more confer, uh, conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Help me have a spirit that, that prays daily, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And I suspect in a room this size that all of us at times, in my own life, we've got sins that we know of and we don't deal with and we just kind of, well, I do so much good here, the Lord will just overlook this area of my life. No, he won't. He won't overlook that area. He wants that area redeemed as much as he wants everything else redeemed of you. And so I would encourage you to pray, Lord, just deliver me from evil. Protect me. Watch over me. And so God sent Jesus into the world, and Joseph, as he's walking toward, uh, down there, he passes Shiloh. And I have to believe, he'd say, hey, there's where the ark of the Lord was. That was the presence of the Lord, where Hannah, you might remember the story where Hannah cried out for a baby boy and said, Lord, please give me a baby. Give me a son. And he gave her Samuel. And the ark was there for 369 years at Shiloh. And they keep walking along and they go by Bethlehem. As they're entering Bethlehem, they see where Rachel was buried. I don't know if that tower was still there or not or that pillar back from Genesis uh, 39. I don't know if it was still there. But uh, I, I would imagine they know the story. They're going back to Bethlehem. But you might remember years earlier, Ruth was from Bethlehem. And Ruth 
married a man named Boaz, and they had a son named Obed, which Obed in uh, Hebrew means slave. Obadiah, that word Obadiah, slave of the Lord or servant of the Lord. They had a son named Obed. He had a son named Jesse, and Jesse had a son named King David. And so when it says he went to the city of David, and again, that's when I, when I was watching some show this week, <coughs> and they were saying it was a different Bethlehem. No, Jesus was born in the city of David, David Bethlehem, which is about six or seven miles away from Jerusalem. That's where Jesus was born. Uh, so it says right here, he went to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And he went there to be taxed with Mary as a spouse wife, being great with child. I, I find that fi uh, these first five verses talk about their journey and the taxing. Luke was a doctor. Many of you know Luke was a Gentile doctor. He wrote the book of Luke and Acts, which by word count is... He's right up there with Paul. Paul's got more books, but word count. Luke and Acts are much bigger than a lot of the words Paul wrote. Uh, you know, as far or the Holy Spirit wrote through Paul. But I find that as a doctor, he goes through these first five things about taxing and traveling. And I was reading this this week, and I guess I've never noticed it. Verse 6 and 7, you'd think a doctor would say a little more. But he says, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished. She should be delivered. She brought her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Story's over. Verse 6 and 7, he's born, put him in a, wrapped him in clothes, put him in a manger. And now we spend the next 12 verses talking about shepherds and angels. It seems to me we would talk more about the birth. And folks, as I studied this this week, the greater story is incredible. And I'm not, I don't want to in the least bit way detract from how awesome the birth of the Savior is. But if it didn't come with the message... If it didn't come with the message, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Could God have said, my son Jesus is going to grow up and I'm sending him the first time as judge, jury, executioner? Him be, uh, the king of the world being born is incredible. But what if he had grown up as, I'm here to be your judge? Doctors are incredible. You know, Some of you know, uh, internal, our family, we've got someone in the hospital right now. In uh, talking to the doctors these last three or four days, it's, it's great to have the wisdom and the knowledge and what doctors can tell you and explain and, and stuff. But man's greatest need is not physical health. If it was, God would have sent a doctor. We call Jesus the great physician. That's, not, that's his side line of work. That's not his principal line of work. If we needed a great economy, I hear all the time about the vote this way or that way or do this or do that for the economy and those that create jobs and God could have sent us a banker. Mankind's greatest problem is called sin, and sin is death. Our greatest need was a Savior. So God in heaven, in His mercy and grace and love for us, sent us a Savior. Not what we want, but what we needed. What we desperately need. And if you're here today or watching at home or sometime in the future, it's this simple. Jesus, forgive me, a sinner. Mean that from your heart and you have a Savior like that. The words are right in your mouth. Cry out from your heart, Lord, forgive me. Maybe some of you have that testimony. That was mine. I remember vividly, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. I, you're not, I'm not your child. I know I'm not. Lord, come into my life. Take over. I've never questioned it since. If, if you're questioning, I, I've heard people, and I was there. Am I saved? Am I not saved? I'm kind of, I don't know. I'm, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Folks, today is the day of salvation. If you question that or struggle with that or wonder about that, let today be the day you say, and, and folks, some of you might be here Christmas and Easter. Some of you watching might be Christmas and Easter. Today, don't say, well, I'll do it tomorrow or next week, or I'll just see what happens. That's not how you want to deal with your eternity. No one's promised this afternoon. No one's promised tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen. So then at verse 8 it says, And there were the same country shepherds abiding in their fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Uh, it's interesting there in Bethlehem, if you read back in uh, Genesis 39 and I think Genesis 45, it says there was a, a tower of Eder, E-D-A-R. That tower of Eder is the tower of the flocks. And Bethlehem, when it was uh, Ephratoth, was where they kept a lot of sheep. And that was still very much the case. They kept sheep. It was a very abundant area, and they did uh, grain and breads. 
And many of you know Beit Lehem means house of bread. Jesus, when he said, I come down from heaven is the bread of life, not like your forefathers ate in the desert, not the manna that Moses and them ate, but I am the true bread of life. He was born in the house of bread. Because it was such a fruitful, productive area, they made lots and lots of bread, and they raised lots and lots of sheep. There was a valley there that they would keep their, uh, their flocks in. They were about six miles from Jerusalem. Two times a day, morning and evening, the priest would uh, kill a, uh, a lamb. A one, it had to be a one-year-old lamb, male lamb, without spot, without blemish, without any broken bones, perfectly healthy one-year-old lamb. And they did that twice a day, 365 days a year, 364 days a year. Every day of the year, they killed two lambs a day. And it had to be a year old. So Bethlehem, they would also raise sheep there. We know David was a shepherd. They raised sheep there in Bethlehem, knowing that that sacrificial system, they had to have more than 700 lambs a year. I, some of you know I have cattle and uh, animals and chickens and turkeys and ducks and the farm. You're not promised that those animals make it a year. Sometimes they don't. So I was thinking about that as they're raising these sheep for the sacrificial slaughter. They had to have not just sheep, but perfect sheep, and they had to be a year old. So they probably had to say, we need a supply of 900, 1,000, 1,200 sheep a year to get the 700 and some, 750 perfect ones, and they've got to be a year old. So we've got, to get them, we've got to get enough sheep that every year we have two a day for all the year. So I was thinking through that, thinking, man, they must have just been, had sheep all the time there. And so sure enough, it says they were shepherds abiding in their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. I'm going to flip real quick to Micah chapter 4, uh, verse 8, I believe it is. I always put these in my notes, and then when I have my notes up here, I can never find it. So it doesn't matter really, I guess, but... In Micah 4.8, um, Jonah, Micah, Habakkuk. In, uh, in, Mark, in Micah 4.8, where it talks about, in Micah 5.2, we'll read that too. In Micah 4.8, it talks about the coming law of, in peace. And it tells us, uh, talking about the Lord reigns in Zion. He says, O thou, tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. And I thought about that. That's the only other time we see in the Bible that Tower of Eder, E-D-A-R. We see it way back in Genesis. And it was a tower that sometimes they would climb up and they would watch their flocks. And they'd look out on the horizon for dangers. And those shepherds, as you know from David's story, if dangers came, what did the shepherd do? Did he run away and leave the sheep? He laid his life down for the sheep. And, and just this morning, as I was driving to church, I was thinking about that thinking the dominion, the king, would be at the tower of the shepherd, the tower of the flock, and he'd be looking out for danger. And I just had the imagery of Jesus hanging on the cross, looking at all humanity, that death was coming for us. And, and the good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, sheep died for the shepherd's sin. The great shepherd the perfect shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. That's, that's an incredible, amazing glory to God in the highest. So these shepherds, um, now I'm in Micah, back to Luke. Close the wrong spot. So in, in Luke chapter 2, so these shepherds, they were uh, keeping their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. The Shekinah glory of the Lord. We saw it. In uh, Chronicles, when the temple was dedicated, it says the smoke came down and light filled the temple and the priest ran out. It was too glorious for them. We saw that Shekinah glory on the face of Moses when he came down from the mountaintop and they had to put a veil over his face. They said the light was so bright they couldn't look at the face of Moses. We saw it at the transfiguration of Jesus. This blinding, bursting, almost, you ever see like uh, lightning? Sometimes when I see lightning, I think that must be what the, that Shekinah glory must look like. It's so white, it's beyond white. But uh, in any event, it says the, the glory came down and shone round about them. And I get a feeling we would be terribly or sore afraid also. That word sore afraid, or what your translation might say, very afraid, in Greek you can understand it too. Megaphobic. Megaphobic is the word in Greek. Yes, I think we know that in English. Greatly afraid, very afraid. It was sore afraid, 
and, and thank the Lord for his mercy. And the angel of the Lord said to them, don't be afraid. That is, I, saw, I heard a sermon a couple weeks ago, and they said probably the most number one sin broken in the church today is people walking around constantly in fear and anxiety. We're told over and over and over and over in the Bible, do not be afraid, do not be anxious, be anxious for nothing. And it says that's probably the number one sin of the church is we walk around in fear all the time. The angel of the Lord said to them, fear not. I bring you good tidings of great joy. Oh, I, I can't imagine what they must have thought. When that angel showed up and the light night sky lit up with bursting light and the angel shows up, I could just see, we're dead men. We talked about that last week with Manoah. When the angel came to talk to Manoah, no, uh, uh, and, he, and he said, we, we've seen an angel. We've seen an angel from the Lord. We're dead men. We're, we're going to die. You don't get to see that kind of glory from God and live. And so it says, the angel says, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to the Jews, to just the Gentiles, to just America, to just Texas, to all people. It's to everybody. Everyone, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. It's, he brings good tidings to all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David. That, those next two words in English are so critical. A Savior. Unto you was born a Savior. We desperately, and I know there's people I talk to sometimes, say, what do I need saving from? There's a, a list, and, and one of them is self, sin. The biggest thing I think we need saving from is the wrath of God. If you're a sinner without God, God's wrath remains on you. And the wrath of God should terrify us. It should make us megaphobic. We should be terribly sore afraid of, if I meet God without Christ as my Savior, you're in an eternity of misery. He sent us a Savior, and there's some titles here. He's a Savior. He's Christ. Christ, they would have easily known that word, Christos, or uh, the M Messiah, the Anointed One. He is the Anointed One, the Holy One of Israel, the Holy One of God. He's our Savior. He's the one that God chose. God anointed the man, Jesus, to be the Savior of the world. And he made him Christ, the anointed one. And because of that, he is Lord. I find also, I said in my prayer a moment ago, this, this king of and creator of all stepped out of glory with 10,000 times 10,000 angels at his beck and call and praising him and singing praises to him. He stepped off that throne and came down to earth and he humbled himself as a little baby laid in a manger and there was no room for them. Folks, something else I'd like you to go home with today is the knowledge of, in our world today, I think we have to make time for Christ. There are so many demands in our time. I, who loves these and hates them? I love them and hate them. They're, they're handy, but they, control, they start controlling you. And, and people will call you. I called you eight minutes ago. You didn't call me back. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I, I don't live like this. Well, you should. Well, I can't, you know. But we live in such a fast-paced world that I think we have to make time. And, it, and it's interesting. It says they, they, there was no room for them. It wasn't just Jesus there was no room for. It was those that his family. And folks, the world may be like that. I know I've been in jobs where they say you're not allowed to pray, you're not allowed to have Bible studies, you're not allowed, this is work. I've been in places that they say you can do those things. There's places that have no room for Jesus nor his family. There was no room for them. And I would encourage you as you go through your week in this new year, Lord, help me carve out time because there's so many demands on our time. And I started thinking there's so many demands on us and really, it's not just demands on us, it's demands on our schedule. I expect you to do all, and then they fill in the blank. Folks, we have to say and push back, I've got to spend time with the Lord. We sing the song, I need thee every moment, I need thee every hour, I need thee, I need thee every minute. But then the world takes over and we get so busy. And even Christmas can be busy. 
If you've got multiple families or blended families, you know, we got to go to this family and this family and this cousin and over there and I'm just waiting for December 26th to get here so I can take a break. It, we, we chuckle because it's true. But folks, I would I'd encourage you to say, I'm not here to please others. I'm here to please Jesus Christ. And I've got to make time for prayer and the study of the word and the ministry of prayer and focus on what Christ is saying because the world is so loud. It's so loud. It's hard for that still quiet voice sometimes to get through to us. And so I would encourage you, maybe now even more than any other time in the history of man, you know, um, to, to focus on making time. If you just say, well, I'll just get time when it's there, you'll never have it. You're going to have to start carving out time and saying, this is my window that I must spend with the Lord. So the Savior is born, Christ the Lord, the one that reigns supreme. And this will be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. I've said this before. If you've been here, you've heard this, I'm sure. If not, maybe you've heard it somewhere else. It might be new to some of you. How is that a sign? You'd say, remember I mentioned earlier about those shepherds, how they would raise those sheep? And, it's, and again, I saw a show this week on TV. That, oh, that's not true. That's not, it's all fake. First off, how would they know? They wouldn't know. They're just, they're just, did God really say? Well, I have read enough other historical documents that said sometimes when they would get that perfect male sheep, the shepherds would, because those sheep are specific sheep. They know that those sheep are going to sacrifice. And they've got to protect those sheep. And it said they would wrap them up with clothes. And it used to be, a, I guess, an old human tradition, different cultures thousands of years ago had it, where they would wrap the baby's arms and legs, and they said it helped the baby grow straight and the limbs would grow straight. And I, I think even to, uh, today, I remember our kids, we'd wrap them, for some reason, you'd wrap them tight. I don't know why. But you get that receiving blanket and wrap them up and they can't move. Because of what? The warmness and the comfort and the holding them. And... Oh, praise the Lord. I'm, there you go. It's comforting. So they would do it then also. But, the, but when they would get the, the shepherds that was raising those baby sheep, and I've heard this numerous times. It said the Jerusalem six miles away. The priests, when they made their royal clothes and their royal linen and their, all their accoutrements they had to wear, they would have scraps of linen left over and scraps of the material left over. And they would give it to the shepherds and say, when you find that perfect male baby sheep, wrap it with these things so we know that that's the one that's coming to be sacrificed one day. And I find that imagery to be fascinating because it says here, you'll find the Savior wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And I think, how would that be a sign? Because aren't all babies wrapped, pr pretty much? I think when it's wrapped in those types of linens, and why did God go to shepherds? Sh could it God have gone to Caesar? Caesar, I'm having a baby born, tell the whole world. It seems like, or go to Times Square, number one Times Square. Go to big giant billboard company or marketing company. But that's not where he went. And I don't think it was by accident. I think he goes, I'm going to shepherds for, for a very specific reason. He takes the lowly and the less esteemed things of the world to confound the wise. And he took these shepherds, he showed them the story as they're out there raising these sheep. And probably the most incredible message the world's ever heard. For thousands of years the world waited. We sing the song, we waited, the world waited in sin and air, opining, opining, waiting, hoping for a Savior, hoping for an answer from heaven. And finally, after thousands of years, the answer comes. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the sign will be for you that you'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, and you thought they were afraid a second ago, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace. Who just wants peace? Peace out there and more importantly, peace in here and in here. Folks, some of you I know are going through a storm and much I think like the disciples in the ship as Jesus was crossing the, the uh, sea with them and he just called the storm, peace be still. And there was peace. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'm sure you've heard it. Sometimes he calms the storm for his child Sometimes he calms his child in the middle of the storm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fire. God could have made the fire go out. He didn't. 
You see all through scriptures God's people going through storms. But you also see God's in the boat with them. God's in the fire with them. When Moses stepped in the water and the seas opened up and, and they had the priests go out with the Ark of the Covenant walking across, God's presence was with them. I, I, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is where Moses was walking. The people were, where are we going? Where are we going? I don't know where we're going. But if God's not with us, I'm not moving. If God doesn't go with us, then I'm not moving anywhere. And folks, we, in our lives, we have to have that same attitude. God, what are you telling me to do today, this morning, this evening? What, what, what are you telling me now? And, and listen to that still, small voice that speaks to us. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go into Bethlehem. They heard the angels, and they instantly said, let's go see what we've heard. And, and we want to see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. I told you last week how glorious that opportunity was for John the Baptist, who John the Baptist got to say, there is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And I said how today, as, as spectacular as that would have been for John the Baptist to be the first one recorded to declare Jesus is the Lamb of God, how we get to do that all the time now. What was a great, incredible honor for John the Baptist, God gives us that honor today. We can tell people Jesus is the Lamb of God. Likewise, with these shepherds, the angels came and gave them a message. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Guess who gets to say that message today? We do. We get to say that same message that angels spoke. I love that song, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Let our mouths, our tongues, our lips carry the fruit of praise to God and to the world and tell the world how awesome God is and the plan of salvation He's prepared for us. And so the angels go away and the shepherds go to see this thing. And they came with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, what they saw was that baby that the angel said, this will be a sign for you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And when they saw that sign, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And what was the saying that was told to them? Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. God in heaven is not sending wrath, he's sending peace. He's sending joy. He's sending a savior. And everyone that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. I find it interesting I talk to atheists and agnostics sometimes, and I'll tell, uh, I talked to one guy who was an atheist. He said, I'm the president of the Atheist of America com Corporation or something. I'm like, do you believe in Santa Claus? No, that's a myth. Why aren't you the president of the anti-Santa Claus group? Or the anti-Easter Bunny Club? Or Casper the Ghost? Why, why, aren't you, why aren't there organizations against those things? If you really think they're fake, why, you're going to spend your life, time, disproving something you don't believe in? Yes. Folks, that's a hard heart. There's no one against those other make-believe stuff, but that person that says, I won't believe in God. So even those that claim they don't believe, I think deep down they do believe. They do believe. Romans 1 says it's not that they never heard the truth, it's that they reject the truth and trade the truth for a lie. And they are trying to convince themselves that their lie is true. Did I mention today that the devil is a liar? I hope so. I like to mention that. And I like to mention it a lot. And uh, they heard it, and they told those things, and, and, they, and the people heard it. And I say that when you talk about Jesus, people have to make a decision about Jesus. Even people that don't believe him say, well, he was a good man, or well, he was a teacher, or well, he was. Jesus is the Savior of the world. That's who Jesus is. <laughs> and, Mary, and Mary also kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Folks, this Christmas message is a time that the infinite became an infant and came and humbled himself. And in the midst of his humiliation, stepping out of heaven and stepping and being laid down in swaddling clothes, laying in that manger, a God in heaven also said, I will exalt that one. And he sent angels. So in his humiliation, there was also exaltation. And we find that throughout the life of Jesus, even on the cross, the humiliation that he must have had on the cross for us. But we know that the Bible tells us that he humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross, 
And because of that, God exalted him to a name higher than all names. With humbleness comes exaltation. That's God's system for Jesus. That's God's system for us. We should be a humble people. And God in his time will exalt. But if we fight like the world does, me first, mine, I got to get me. That's not God's system. God's system is he came not to be served, but to serve. And that should be our, our attitude as well. So in the physical realm, there was humiliation. In the spiritual realm, there was exaltation. And folks, I leave you today as our praise group comes forward. We're uh, going to have a time of invita invitation right now. And folks, if you're not sure that you're sure, this would be a wonderful time, Christmas Eve, to co just come down to the altar and say, Lord, forgive me a sinner. There will be people who would be happy to pray with you or answer any questions you might have. Or if you just want to come down and pray at this time of invitation. We're gonna do, we'll do this song of invitation at the end of this song. Uh, then we will um, have the Lord's Supper. So if the Lord's speaking to you today, if you'd like to join, if, if the Lord's telling you to join our church, we'd love to have you come join today. If you need baptism, again, folks, I can't stress enough the importance of salvation in Jesus Christ. Whatever the Lord's telling you to do, do today.